and use the step up transformer to a higher voltage. Why do we do higher voltage step up? Because for the same power, the voltage times the current times the power factor that is equal to power. If you increase the voltage for the same amount of power, the current will be reduced. So if the current is reduced, the I squared R or I squared X losses will be lower. That is why we want to transmit at a higher voltage the power we want to transmit at a higher voltage. So for the same power, the current is lower, the losses will be lower. But at the end, after you transmit over long distance, at the load center, you have to step down again because all the appliances and all, they are built for lower voltages again. So the long distance transmission, use it like a highway, like in roadways, you know, we have a highway, you have collector lanes and you have, you know, uh, small street lights. Same way the power system is built like that. You know, you have generation at lower voltage, step it up, at a higher voltage, transmit over long distance, step down, transmit using distribution lines again, and then connect the loads. Again, in the interest of time, I won't cover all the points, but the slides are available to you as a reference. So very key points I would like to cover. So uh, one important thing with the AC lines is the voltage drop. Because of the reactants in the lines, the longer the line, the more voltage drop across the line, then we have to boost up the voltage using shunt reactive power or shunt reactive compensation using static wall compensator or a simple capacitor in some cases or a statcom which is a, another uh, power electronics device called fax device, flexible AC transmission systems device. So we, you hear a little bit more about them as we go through but uh, basically what they do is they provide reactive support, reactive power so to boost your voltage close to one per, one per unit or 100%. Uh, so one of the you know, advantages of AC is the step up and step down and all that, but the disadvantage is the voltage drop and also the stability. Stability in general is stable. Stable means stable means it's continuously operating without any interruption, right? When you have a fault on the line, the system may become unstable, okay? And also even some small disturbance means like a load change um, can cause instability in the AC system. So these are some of the issues with the AC system you have to design so that AC system will work perfectly during normal operations as well as for fault conditions. Now let's see DC transmission, what DC transmission can do. DC transmission, again the generation is still AC, so we have to convert AC to DC using converters and transmit using DC transmission lines for a long distance and then invert DC back to AC because our distribution lines are still AC, our equipment, the loads are all still AC. So only the transmission level, we are using DC. Uh, the advantage of DC transmission is it controls the power exactly the way you want. You want 100 megawatts in that line, you can just control exactly like a water in a pipe with the where you can just do the control such that 100 megawatts will go. Whereas in the case of AC, AC power flow depends on the system impedances. Whereas DC power flow depends on the controls of the DC converter. So it just can program exactly the amount that you would like to send on that line. 
Also the DC losses, um, I have another slide later, but DC losses are lower than the AC losses. So one of the reasons is DC, when you talk about DC, there is no reactance. Even though line has reactance, when you apply DC voltage, you don't worry about the reactance of the line. Only resistance of the line is coming into the picture for, uh, uh, you know, the, for uh, transferring power. So the I squared R losses are lower. But the disadvantage is the DC converter stations, these are power electronics converter stations, they are expensive. Whereas in the case of AC, you have AC substations, they are very reasonable price, they are not that expensive compared to DC converter stations. So the point we have to make here is adding this extra expense for the converter stations when DC is economical when AC is economical. So that is the comparison you have to make. When do you build AC lines? When do you build DC lines? HVDC has very unique application, set of applications. One is long distance power transfer because in the, you know, if you consider small distances, maybe 50 miles, 100 miles, overhead lines. AC is still economical because DC converter station costs are higher. But when it goes for more than 300 miles or so, um, I'm sorry I'm using miles because of the US uh, system, but you, you go with kilometers, so, so roughly about 500 miles is 800 kilometers, so it's five, to eight ratio, so you need to convert in your mind how much I'm talking about. Um, the other opportunity for HVDC is, uh, say you are, you know, interfacing, say, South Korea to, say, North Korea or uh, some other countries, you want to interconnect, but you don't want all their problems to come into your system. You want to isolate the systems, but interconnect with certain amount of power transfer. So what we call a synchronous interconnection, the second bullet there, is um, if you, even if you have different frequencies, you know, like in Japan, they have 50 hertz system, AC system, and 60 hertz AC system. If they want to interconnect both of them, they need a back-to-back -back DC. So the asynchronous interconnection DC is an application. Another thing in general is uh, if you have an AC system, so for example in South Korea, you have an AC, predominantly AC system, you have a DC cable and you're also building plus or minus 500 kV uh, double DC line that's coming up soon. That's where when you have a DC line added to your existing AC system, the AC lines which are in parallel or in the loop can also carry more power than what they were carrying before just by adding DC line. The DC line will increase the power transfer. So because of the controllability and uh, also in increased stability of the system. So that is the advantage. How it does, it basically increases the voltage on the AC system also. When you increase the voltage in the AC system, it also increases the power flow on the AC system. So it is not only contributing, DC is not only contributing its own power, controlled power, but it also increases overall power transfer on the AC line. Advantages, other advantages, lower losses. Typically 20% lower losses than AC system. The losses, when you consider to the losses, the converter has a losses too. But uh, HVDC has only two conductors. HVAC has three conductors. So the lines itself, the losses in DC will be only two third of AC losses. But if you add converter losses, both rectifier and inverter losses, so about 20% lower losses for HVDC compared to AC. 
and uh, less expensive circuit breakers too. The reason is uh, with HVDC, you can control, especially the line commutated converter technology. Again, these technical terms will be more clear during my presentation later. I will tell you two different types of converters. One is voltage source converters, which are coming up recently using um, transistors like integrated gate bipolar transistors. The other one is, which has been there for last 50 years, based on thyristors, line commutated converters, LCC, which you really limit the current, DC current constant most of the time. Even if you have a fault on the DC line, the current is the same as the load current. So that's how you need less expensive circuit breakers. Some other benefits, if you have a congested fan in an AC system, congested means uh, you're getting too much power flow or we call loop flow. If that AC line is supposed to carry 100 megawatts, but it's carrying 120 megawatts, heating up the equipment, overloading the transformers, overloading the line. So one way of doing that is build a DC line or convert that AC line for DC operation. Limit the power to 100 megawatts, not 120 anymore. So that's the releasing the congestion. Increasing transmission capacity means existing AC line may have, say again example, 100 megawatts power flow, but you want to convert that for DC operation, you can increase it to 150 or even sometimes 200 megawatts on the same corridor. So you can increase the power by 50% or by 100% by converting for DC. And similarly, you have other advantages like black start when you have a, a major outage in the system. DC can be used to black start the entire system. If you have a voltage stability or transient stability problems in the AC system, if you have a DC link, again, DC link can improve the uh, stability limits, uh, either voltage stability or um, angle stability, even the frequency control in your AC system. Lot of advantages of HVDC. Another thing is power oscillation damping. Uh, what it means again is uh, in an AC system, when you have sp uh, load changes or generation changes, Sometimes a small oscillation will come, power flow will not be at the same level, it goes up and down a little bit, and then it picks up, the oscillation keeps on increasing because of negative damping. The system is not damped well enough, and the oscillations will build up, ultimately the system will separate or collapse. So if you have a DC, the DC control will provide positive damping basically eliminate those oscillations. Even though oscillations start coming, you damp out those oscillations, the system will be stable, the power flow will be maintained and avoid the breakdown of the system. And the other thing is HVDC systems, when we talk about, we are only talking about real power. DC only real power means the megawatts. You don't have to worry about reactive power in, on the DC line because there is no reactive power needed on the DC line. At the converter station, yes, you need. You need 50 to 60 percent. Both rectifier as well as inverter you need to provide using filters, STATCOM or synchronous generator. You need to provide reactive support at the converter stations. When it gets to the DC line itself, it's only megawatts that is going in the line. Now coming back to the cost, relative cost of AC versus DC. Certainly the cost issue when it comes to substations, AC substations are cheaper, but DC converter stations are more expensive. In terms of reliability, if you compare a double circuit or 
a double HVDC three-phase circuit, as you see here, the first bullet, with six conductors, is needed to get the same reliability of a two-pole, means two-line DC link, or bipolar DC link. So the advantage of DC in terms of right-of-way and all are very significant here. DC also requires less insulation. For the same conductor, DC losses are less. An optimized DC link has smaller towers than an optimized AC link because you are only talking about two conductors versus six conductors to get the same amount of power transfer. So when you compare like that, then you get into what is called break-even distance. When is AC economical? How long distance AC is economical? After which DC takes over? So here in this chart, you can see AC uh, two circuits. As you see, there are two circuits here shown. 400 kV, two times 400 kV. Means this is one 400 kV three-phase AC, another 400 kV three-phase AC. For the same megawatts here, you build a HVDC line, a bipolar line, plus or minus 400 kV. See the size of the thing, the tower and all that is much smaller than that AC. And the break-even distance is where, you know, DC is more economical. But uh, in the next slide, you'll see a little bit more, uh, not this slide, a couple of slides later. I'll get you the actual numbers, make note of those numbers. Those are very important for you. Typical tower structures, you see, you know, for 500 kV HVDC, and again, AC here, and then two times 500 kV AC. So they're all carrying 2,000 megawatts of capacity. Certainly, DC tower structure is simple, and it occupies less space. So right of way in general for uh, AC, for AC is more than 70% wider than the right of way for DC line of equivalent capacity. This is really important because getting new right of way to build lines is very difficult these days because uh, if the environmental issues public opposition to build lines. They don't want to give too much of their land to build new lines. So those are also will contribute to the decision making final, make, uh, whether you want to go build AC lines versus DC lines. HVDC cables also very popular these days because first of all, the cables can go underground or under sea, under the water. Secondly, you know, that way you don't have to get a new right of way, you know, it's underground. Uh, the environmentally, they are kind of benign. In the faults also, there is a fault in the HVDC cable. Generally, it is a major problem, major outage that comes. Just for, say, lightning or something, you don't get the cable faults that easily because they are buried underneath the, you know, um, ground or water. But of course, they are costly. So you have to make a decision for which application, uh, whether you want to use a cable versus a line. AC versus DC is still the remaining cost. Like as I mentioned earlier, the line cost is one thing, the converter costs are more expensive in DC. The line costs are also lower in DC because you are building two poles or two conductors for DC whereas for AC, three conductors. HVDC cost really increases with length. So both for AC and DC, you need to calculate the line cost and the converter cost and then compare them. When you compare, then you get to this, what is called the break-even distance. So from say zero to 300 miles or so, AC lines are cheaper because AC substation costs are cheaper 
and then the DC is more expensive for short distance. But uh, as you approach 300 miles per hour at lines, DC becomes more economical. Similarly, for cables, 30 miles is the break-even distance. Anything over 30 miles, DC cable is better. Under 30 miles, his AC cable is more economical. So they just, uh, these are again specific to a system, but these are some average numbers based on you know, different studies we have done and uh, talking to different utilities. So this is a good strategy when you are doing studies, whether you build an AC line versus DC. Also, the capacity, the megawatt capacity, how many megawatts you are transferring on that line depends on the break-even distance as well. For some example, you take 2,000 megawatts, if you draw a line here, you know, you see here, 500 miles here, but this is a old chart that was published in 1998. So as you see here, 500 miles used to be the break-even distance, which is 800 kilometers, okay? AC versus DC. That used to be the break-even distance before. But now, the recent numbers are only 300 miles break-even distance. So please make a note of that. So, because of the technology improvements, the converter technologies have improved a lot. The costs have come down. So the break-even distances have changed now. Another comparison you do, cost comparison, AC versus DC. Here, considering all the factors, not only the lines and converters, the first two bullets are converter costs, line costs, but the corridor costs also. And another important aspect is operation and maintenance costs. No, operating an HVDC line versus HVAC line the operation and maintenance cost. And the most important one is given here at the last bullet, losses. A lot of people don't think of cost associated with the losses. With the DC, you have less losses. So if you are running these lines for 30 to 40 years, these losses add up because every day, every minute you are using the line, you have lower losses in DC. The cost associated with those losses is humongous, a large amount. So the bottom line is you need to consider not only the initial costs of building lines and stations, converter stations or DC, AC substations, but also losses and the costs associated with losses for the entire lifespan, 30 to 40 years of the equipment. We call a term life cycle costing. Means life cycle means beginning of the construction, operation, start operation, all the way to the end of life of that equipment, which is 30 to 40 years life. So then you do your analysis, then you say which is economical, okay? Just to give you an idea of some numbers of costs of transmission lines in North America, when we talk to few utilities, you got some numbers for different voltages, like 138 kV, 230 kV, 345 kV, 500 kV, 765 kV lines, and the costs associated with that, you know, line length in miles here, and transmission costs. It used to be general number is one million for you know megawatt mile. That's what we used to use that number, but that that has gone up quite a bit now because of you know inflation and other issues as well as corridor costs have gone up. So it varies now here one million here all the way up to in some cases it could go up to close to eight million depending on the congestion of the path and right of way and all that. So. So they're all over the place. So in Korea, South Korea, you might also want to do some analysis, see how much a line costs, AC line for megawatt mile. That means, what is megawatt mile? 
to transfer one megawatt a distance of one mile. Okay, the cost associated for that. That means the material that you you use, all that, and the, including the um, corridor right of way costs and all that. Okay, but just give you some numbers. If you don't have any number, you pick some average numbers here, depending on the voltage rating you have to do initial studies, and then you talk to your um, people, the landowners and all that, then come up with the real cost of the line. Similarly, HVDC lines too, you do the costs. HVDC system cost analysis, the converter costs, line costs, and transmission corridor costs. These are the three costs. In the case of converter itself, if you divide the cost structure within the converter, the converter transformers is almost uh, mo the most expensive. Uh, converter transformers is one of the components which are expensive. The valves are expensive. And the control systems are reasonable, about 7%. So these percentages all add up to 100%. So various components are given here. AC filters, about 10%, things like that. Just to give you an idea of which component of a converter station costs how much. Now, this is another interesting chart here. Initially, we saw break-even distance based on only the line costs and converter costs. But in this one, what I added is, see, for example, you take AC. This is the line, AC line cost, total. This is total DC, and this is the total AC, AC line cost. AC line cost has AC substation, terminal cost here, AC line cost, and then losses. You also add up the losses. So if we add up the losses, then that will be your total AC cost, the losses over the life of the equipment. Similarly, for DC also, DC terminal cost, which is converter cost, a lot higher than the AC terminal cost because AC substation is cheaper than DC. And then the DC line cost, you add to that. And then DC losses, which are lower, so you add that too. Then you get total DC cost. Now your break-even point is shifting towards, towards zero, means it's less. So this point is what you need to worry about, not the dotted lines where without any loss consideration. The dotted lines give you a break-even distance here, whereas considering losses, the break-even distance is really here. That means even for less in length, DC is more economical considering the losses. A lot of people never consider those losses. They think, oh yeah, why do you worry about losses right now? You're just building AC versus DC, the present investments, then let's consider that. But losses is very, very important to consider in your equation of evaluating costs, okay? M make sure you, you do that analysis. Even if it is an approximate analysis, it is worth doing it because you get the clear picture. So we, in that, you know, based on that losses and all that, we did a study. Actually, ABB has uh, done this study and I copied here is DC alternatives for a 500 kV bipole, 3,000 megawatts, and um, a 500 kV by two bipoles, 4,000 megawatts of capacity. Again, 600 kV bipole, 3,000, 800 kV bipole, 3,000 megawatts. AC alternatives considered a two, two single circuits of 500 kV or a double circuit line or a 765 kV, two single circuits. But the rating of all those comparisons here are the same rating almost, except this one is 4,000 megawatts here. Or you can have a hybrid corridors. You can have an AC circuit and a DC circuit also in the same corridor. Say plus or minus 500 kV bipole plus 500 kV single circuit. And the total capacity becomes like 3,000 plus 1,500, 4,500 megawatts. So what is the station cost, transmission line cost, distance in miles, you know, basically we did the cost analysis. This is the total cost. And then also you have to amortize the cost over 30 years period using some interest rates, 
So those are all done. So basically what it gives you is cost per here megawatt hour. So these numbers really will determine which alternative is the best. For example, a bipole is a 7.69 here and then you can also consider hybrid but then you are paying a little bit more, $10.83 here. So different configurations will give you different cost